Time having arrived, we call this meeting of the Brockton School Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We normally uh, open the meeting with uh, hearing of visitors, which is an opportunity for people uh, to come forward and be address the school committee and the superintendent and the mayor. Uh, and uh, anytime someone wants to be heard at a school committee meeting, they can sign up for prior to 7 o'clock at the front desk. Uh, tonight, however, we did not have anyone register for hearing of visitors, so we'll go right on to the agenda for tonight's meeting. Our first order of business, or do I do the plan? Okay, all right. We're actually going to do a special presentation right now. Uh, we want to, from time to time here at school committee meetings, we like to recognize Brockton students uh, when they have outstanding <coughs> achievements. And uh, recently we had several middle school students from the area among a hundred statewide to earn the John F. Kennedy Make a Difference Award, which recognizes their volunteer work in their communities. President Kennedy was a strong supporter of community service and believed that every person can make a difference and each of us should try. These individuals have been given special consideration by their academic mentors because they've distinguished themselves through their service work. They were nominated by a teacher, principal, or counselor for their contributions. A ceremony was held on March 13th at the Kennedy Library and Museum to commend those award recipients by granting them personalized certificates recognizing their work on the project for which they were nominated. The students honored at the ceremony are excellent examples of JFK's call to service, and having our youth involved with the community is one way to ensure prosperity in our cities and towns. Armin Merrion from Brockton West Middle School was among the recipients recognized for their community service projects. And uh, I'm exceptionally proud to see uh, a young man like Armin uh, committing himself to public service and recognizing the importance of making our neighborhoods better. Uh, Armin's been involved in a number of community service projects, uh, particularly volunteering uh, with the football team at the Sand Bar, uh, in addition to the holiday parade and many other endeavors. So we want to commend Armin for his hard work and setting a positive example to the youth throughout the city. And at that's this time, we'd like to invite Armin up here for a special presentation. Job, buddy. Can I bring Dr. Cliff Murray up? Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Oh, sure. We'll bring Dr. Cool. Murray up. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we, we have a plaque to present to Armin. Uh, official citation be it known that the mayor of Brockton hereby extends his congratulations to Armin J. Marion in recognition of having earned the John F. Kennedy Make a Difference Award for his outstanding and admirable commitment to the City of Champions. This citation is duly signed by the mayor of the City of Brockton on this day, the 8th of April, 2014, and it's my pleasure to present it to Armin. There you go. Here's Hold that up in front of you. Let's get some pictures. Got a good one? Thank you. There we go. Good job, buddy. Congratulations. All right, enough of the fun stuff. Now we get on to the serious business. Uh, the, uh, we have a consent agenda, as usually our first order of business. This is the manner in which the school committee can handle a, a, a block of routine pieces of business at one time to move the meeting along. However, uh, amongst the consent agenda, any individual school committee member can ask that an item be removed from the consent agenda for individual consideration. So at this time, do I have any requests regarding the consent agenda? Mr. Minicello. Order number four. Item D to be removed from the consent agenda. Mrs. Sullivan? Item B. B. So we have B and D. Anyone else? 
Okay, so at this time I'll entertain a motion on the consent agenda accepting items B and D. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Approved. Okay, now the two items that were removed. First, uh, Mr. Minicello, item D. Uh, we always like to recognize generosity of uh, families and uh, friends and businesses of the community who donate to the Brockton Public Schools. We have uh, on the agenda the Patrick J. Brennan Memorial Scholarship. Um, the family of Patrick Brennan would like to award a scholarship to a graduating student athlete of Brockton High School who's looking to pursue a degree in education or social sciences. Uh, Pat was a passionate educator and coach for over 35 years at Brockton High School. He touched the lives of so many people in Brockton, on the fields, courts, and in, and in his guidance office. He saw the best in each young student athlete and helped bring out that best. Anyone who was fortunate enough to play for Pat also knew he wanted their experience to be fun. The family uh, would like to recognize a graduating student that embodies this passion and conviction that were so true to who Pat was. The recipient will not necessarily need to be the most recognized student athlete, but the student athlete with ex exceptional passion and work ethic for all they do in the classroom and on the field of play. Pat was someone who believed in doing the right thing, even if it wasn't the most popular thing to do. As Pat used to say, character is who you are when no one is watching. How true that is. The scholarship candidate should possess the same character and courage of conviction. Uh, the generosity of the family is going to be for this first year starting out $500 for one student. Um, so that is a wonderful gift to the Brockton community and we certainly thank his family and wish them condolences for their loss. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add a quick personal comment if I could, Mr. Minicello. Also, I, I knew Pat, and he was a great guidance counselor, great coach, and for myself, many years uh, broadcasting boxer basketball games, and Pat was the longtime girls basketball coach, and he was just uh, an outstanding individual and a real class act and very devoted to his, uh, very devoted to both his students and his athletes. So I think this is a, a great way to remember Pat, and I'm sure he'd be very happy with it. And just to echo really those same sentiments, uh, Mayor Carpenter, having been in the district you know, for a long time, uh, I knew him as a fellow teacher and guidance counselor. He was dedicated, he was part of our team, and uh, I'm very pleased that uh, his family is, is certainly willing to do this to honor his memory. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Approved. Now, back to Mrs. Joyce, item B. Mrs. Sullivan. Oh, Mrs. Sullivan, I'm sorry. Mrs. Sullivan, I apologize. Okay, I'd just like to point out um, that um, the Brockton Community Schools, I am the school committee member that sits on the board for them, and my kids went through the schools in Brockton, and I'm still learning things that, the Brockton Community Schools is amazing, um, things that they do. I mean, I'm always learning. Uh, the driver ed, I'd like to point out, um, there's a $50 discount for students that get honor roll status, which I never knew that either. And the Bernardi Honda also donates the vehicle, which is awesome. And um, the, right now they're working on uh, classroom and on the road driving, and there's an anti-texting campaign that sounded really interesting. Um, it, it might be able to go onto the TVs in the school that the kids can see, and um, they're considering night classes. Another thing I wanted to point out was um, for the, like when the snow days and things like that, they're looking into um, maybe opening up a school to the kids so the kids have a place to go. I thought that was really important on snow days. And then there's an extended time when the kids won't be able to be in school, that they'll have a place to go. And also, um, the superintendent's transition team reception was awesome, and the food was amazing. So, yeah, that's it. Just to follow up on that, you know, when you mentioned the transition team, the food was amazing because it was prepared by our yes. students. And Which to watch them serve, um, Mr. Macrina had, I think, some of his jazz band playing. Um, yes. We were even dancing in the middle of the fine arts, so yeah. it was it yep. was a great time, enjoyed by all. And I'm glad, Judy, that you bring up the $50 um, 
off of the driver ed for honor roll students. That's mm -hmm. a great I incentive for, it's not just the students at Brockton High. It's our students from, again, Southeastern Regional, Cardinal Spelman, really? okay. Norfolk Agricultural School. So any of our students that want to <coughs> take driver ed, that's, that's an, and the parents really look forward to, you know, their children getting that discount. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I think when you mention the snow day, the issue, of course, is don't forget we have a thousand youngsters in extended day during the school year. So it's something that we've talked about. Um, I don't dare say we had a mild winter. I'm just glad I, I think it's over. But um, it is something that we keep talking about, maybe having a central location if it's a day that we're able to plow a particular school and have parents, almost like a vacation site option. So right. very good points. And there was just one more thing I wanted to point out. There's a 100% passing rate for students that use the driver's ed vehicle and the instructor. 100% is good, because both my kids didn't use the car and they both flunked the first time. <laughs> <laughs> so, for parents that have kids coming up for driving, you know that's the way to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. And, and I'm glad you gave a shout out to Bernardi. Um, he yeah, always used to make fun of really me when we would talk about the fleet of cars in community schools. But, you know, it's a lease. Um, our hope is that when the lease is up, we'll be able to get a new car. And okay. it would be great if we had that support from certainly, you know, any other providers, uh, car dealers in the area would love to welcome them to you know, certainly approach us if we could do the same thing. I think it's great advertising for them, and it's certainly a great support of the school system. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, mm. how about a motion? Motion to accept the um, community school advisory board minutes. Second. Seconded. All in favor? <coughs> Motion approved. Okay, so this will bring us uh, to the superintendent of schools uh, report on teaching and learning. Okay, uh, first of all, I would like our student representative, uh, Jessica Freeborn, to give us an update of what's happening at Brockton High School, but before she does, I will have to tell you, uh, last week were, you know, sometimes we talk about night meetings, and I know you're out, I see you certainly up at the central office many, many nights uh, with your subcommittee meetings and negotiations, but last Tuesday and Wednesday I had the opportunity to be up here, and Tuesday night was the concert, the Brockton High concert, and I just told Jess, I thought I saw her, I was struggling to make sure that it was her, but just a phenomenal job and makes us proud. Wednesday night I got to see the All City Chorus up here. 400 youngsters up on that stage with our middle schoolers, our high schoolers, uh, just, just a sight to see. So congratulations on a great performance. And take it away. Well, Brockton High has been crazy busy lately. All good news. Um, last week, our wind ensemble and senior jazz band traveled to Washington, D.C., and we got to attend the Festival of Music, which was in Virginia. Um, and we did exceptional. Wind Ensemble was awarded Superior first overall, and our Senior Jazz Band was also awarded Superior. Um, the trip was amazing and definitely an experience I will never forget. We got to go to all the monuments, and then we got to go to a theme park, and it was just a great experience musically, and just we got to learn so much about history, and we got to like see what we learn about in the classroom and then actually get to go and see like the picture of Lincoln that we see in his little memorial and then you get to go see it and I'm like it's a lot bigger in person <laughs> so that was very very exciting so it was a great trip and our junior wind ensemble as well as the concert choir here at Brockton High attended the MICA festival this past weekend and they did phenomenal. The junior wind ensemble was awarded a silver medal and um, the concert choir was, they received a gold medal. So everyone did really well in the music department this weekend so that was very exciting. Um, as well, um, over the weekend some of our students participated in the HOSA conference at UMass Medical School. At the conference, students participated in over 22 competitions regarding health and science. Mariah Lynn won first place for transcultural health and Darlene Tustelin won second place. Sally Almakar and Myrna Lanou won second place for CPR and first aid and Tammy Young was the third place winner. So lots of wins at Brockton High, so we're very proud boxers. Um, moving on, spring sports have started up. Um, BHS tennis, softball, and baseball is already on with their practices and scrimmages and games, and everyone is already really excited and doing very well. So that's exciting as the weather gets nicer. 
Um, and I'm excited because April vacation is coming very quickly, <laughs> um, which will be starting with um, having Good Friday off April 18th. Um, and then the year is moving by very fast. Report cards for term three will be given to students the Tuesday after April vacation, April 29th. Um, so years flying by. Um, all right, um, peer mediation, which is a group of volunteer students who have volunteered to help their peers solve problems, have started their interviews for next year. They have 30 openings, and um, how it works is um, teachers recommend students who um, they think would be a great person for the job, and you go in, and I actually um, got chosen to have my interview, and I had it today, and you go in and you meet with either Miss Gordon or Miss Lynch, and you sit down and they ask you all these different questions, and they put you in different scenarios of what you would do if you were in a situation to help someone else. So that was definitely an experience that was very cool to learn about. And lastly, today was a very special day at Brockton High because it was Dress for Success Day where all the students got to dress up and have a, like an excuse to be all fancy or um, several dressed up as nurses and doctors or they just got to dress up as sport players and just show what their future is holding. So it was a very good week at Brockton High so far. Certainly, lots happening, and uh, so much. Just to follow up, Jess, we also have the Youth Summit coming up um, this Thursday, Thursday. Uh, the tenth. The mayor and I will be attending. I think we're going to be there about 4:30. And uh, one of the things we want the youth to know is if there is any follow-up, we'll be happy to meet with them in one of the youth uh, voice groups just to follow up with some of their suggestions and recommendations to us. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. The um, Dress for Success Day, um, again, one of our partners, Marion's Tuxedos, provided many of the students with some really nice um, suits and tuxedos. Um, they, I had to help my son this morning <laughs> 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 with his cufflinks and his bow tie. Um, but uh, they look great, you know, and it's really a nice um, event. They, um, the, the kids just look so grown up. That, I mean, that's really what it, it's unbelievable. They're growing so fast, and uh, the year is going by so quickly, as you said. Uh, but you know, this is what it's all about. I mean, community and partnering with our, our businesses. And, um, you know, Marion's Tuxedos has been very generous to the Brockton Public Schools as well. So, um, yeah, great event, as usual. <coughs> our proms are coming up, so... Uh, We'll, we'll be, uh, we will not be attending, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, lots of kids will be, and they'll, they'll look great for that as well. So. I think I'm going to invite a school committee member this year, so we'll continue that. Yeah. The practice that Mike started, I thought it was a great practice, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to put the invitation out there as long as you do not have a child attending. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, scratch me from the junior prom. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you very much, Jess. And uh, tonight we actually, uh, I have the pleasure of uh, bringing up, you've heard me talk about Footsteps to Brilliance. I know uh, new members on the school committee, we had an event in February where we brought in business partners, we brought in um, other schools in the Brockton area, whether they be daycares, um, head start programs, we brought in business or biz businesses, we brought in foundations, all to look at a program that I think is a worthy program for our youngsters. You've heard me talk about reaching the very youngest, a three-year-old, all the way to seven-year-olds, and it talks about literacy. It talks about the, the vocabulary, the word that, words that a child is exposed to before they ever come to the Brockton Public Schools or any of our partners. So here tonight, I'd like to invite uh, Eileen Rosenthal, the CEO of Footsteps to Brilliance. I'd like her to share with you um, some information, and we'll open it up to questions. I'll also invite Laurie Silva to join us from our Grants and Development Office to let you know what has happened since we last met with Footsteps to Brilliance, which was the end of February. And the mayor and I have uh, the distinction of being up on the billboard <laughs> up at Brockton High School. You know, and that is really talking to the community and wanting people to come on board and support uh, literacy and to support our children. So, Eileen? Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Superintendent Smith and uh, Mayor Carpenter. It is a real pleasure to be in the City of Champions. I love the sculpture as we drive in. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Jessica is quite an impressive young lady. So um, very, very impressive and a beautiful building here. Thank you so much. Um, I'm also among some now older friends in terms of um, people who I know and some of the school committee members are new to me so I want to say hello to you. Um, I would like to talk about something that is transformative. As um, Superintendent Smith mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Footsteps to Brilliance. But this is the culmination of 25 years of work with technology and education in schools. For some of you who may uh, have been around that long, in 1992 I co-founded a company called Lightspan. Lightspan grew out of a report that was put forth from the Congress that talked, it was called Prisoners of Time, and it talked about the fact that after the nation at risk came out, and they said that if a foreign country did to us what we're doing to ourselves in education, we would declare it an act of war. The Congress said 15 years later, all right, let's see what kind of reform has happened. And this report came out and said there's been a lot of reform that's happened, but you know something? It's not going to make a difference. And the reason it's not going to make a difference is because we in the United States only have 180 days of school. We have six hours a day. About three hours of that is taken up with things that aren't directly related to reading language arts and mathematics. And we're not going to be competitive internationally with the Asian countries, with the European countries, who spend significantly more time. So it became clear to me, and has been a mission for me, in terms of how do we increase time on task? How do we make a connection between the school and the home? How do we get the parents involved in their children's education? And how do we give them the tools? And there were many lessons learned over the years. One of the lessons learned is that the parent needs to be involved, the school has to be at the helm, and that engagement is key, key, key to learning. So I want to tell you about a few things that led me to create Footsteps to Brilliance. First of all, Footsteps to Brilliance is a pre-K through third grade program with the idea that what is the challenge, what's the dilemma that we all face today? We face the fact that a significant number of our children are not reading at grade level at third grade. And that's really a benchmark because the children who don't read at grade level at third grade, 80% of them really don't make it in the world. They drop out or worse. So the statistic, and this came from the Kellogg Foundation, was that overall nationwide, 46% of our children are entering kindergarten at risk of failure. Now that means that we're throwing away nearly half of our children by the age of five. 88% of those children never catch up. And 61% of those children have no children's books in their home. So in essence, we know that Michelle Obama talks about a um, food desert. But for many of our children, they're living in a literacy desert. Now, we know that there are a lot of changing demographics, and that puts more stress in terms of the need for multilingual instruction on the schools. And we know that although parents are the most important person in their children's life when it comes to academic success, many of them lack the information and knowledge they need to prepare their children for school. So what does the research say about this? We know what the challenges are. Well, many of you may have heard of two researchers, Hart and Risley. And what Hart and Risley did is they did a longitudinal study to find out why there was such a discrepancy between at-risk and affluent students. They actually got to go into the homes of different um, people, um, what they called back then welfare and um, and blue collar and um, professional. And what they came out with was a conclusion that was somewhat startling. That an at-risk child hears 30 million fewer words before the age of four. 
That means that when they enter your kindergarten, they have 25% of the vocabulary they need to succeed. And um, NAEP has done a study and, and kind of confirmed that vocabulary is linked to comprehension. We all know that. But there was a recent study that came out from Stanford University, and it said that this gap really happens as early as 18 months. And it's not just when you're, when you're in this critical phase and you're not immersed in language, what happens is that the processing speed slows down. So that if you say to a child, look at a dog, the affluent child looks at the dog, the dog is on the sofa. The affluent child has learned the dog is on the sofa. The several seconds difference in processing look at the dog means that all that other information has been lost. You can imagine this gets magnified as the children get older. One other thing, a successful reader has 3,000 hours of pre-literacy training before they reach first grade. For an at-risk student, it's between 20 to 200 hours. So there's a huge discrepancy. So knowing what the challenges are and knowing what the research says, the real key issue is not, you know, how can I help these 50, these 250 students? The real issue is, how can we transform the le early learning environment in a way that really makes a system-wide impact? How can we do something that is truly game-changing and get the entire community involved? And that is what Footsteps to Brilliance has set out to do. Now, one of the most important things, as we talked about, and this is true in almost, we read the um, strategic plans of, of the uh, different school districts across the nation, and truthfully, Number one is always going to be, let's improve the academic success of our students. Number two, let's improve the professionalism of our teachers. Number three is usually, let's reach out to the parents in the community. Whereas there's tons of strategies on number one and number two. Traditionally, it's been very hard to reach the hard to reach parents. Obviously not the ones who are volunteering all the time. And that is why when four years ago, and I saw, and it's unbelievable because we all, right, we live with this, right? We're, we're connected. When I saw a video on a cell phone, I thought, my gosh, we have a way of connecting school and home that we've never had before. And I did research and realized that we have a mega trend here that really needs to be exploited for education in a way that hasn't been done before. We therefore built, after doing a lot of research, we built a platform that's completely unique. This platform allows us to put any content on it and overnight scale it to any device, any Apple device, any Android device, any computer, traditional computer. It can be this size, it can be 10 inches, it can be seven inches. In other words, we really are looking at how you can be device agnostic. Now, I, we have a little two minute video, it's actually less than two minutes, and it kind of shows you this um, transformative way of scaling early learning that has never been done before. So I wanna just show this to you, assuming that I can get it to start. There we go, I'm finding it. Aha, now let's see. Nope, oh, pressed the wrong thing, there we go. Doing something wrong here. Let's try this again. There we go. Sorry. As a superintendent of public schools, oh. you know that students Excuse do not me? read proficiently. No. Let me see. By third grade, I am going to try to go back and come back again. This obviously had a problem. There, it, there is visual that goes with this. Mm -hmm. We are going to stop this right now. Um, <laughs> let me see if there is any way that um, that I can show this to you. A second ago, where is Robert? A second ago, didn't the visual show? Let yeah. me try that. Yeah. I wonder. Do we, um, would you know, Cheryl, what might be happening here? Well, there's a video here 
But it's not showing the video, it's only showing the audio. I'm not, not, po not positive that we can get that. It wouldn't hook up. It wouldn't hook. No. Can you turn around and um, progress it? No, progress it a little further down. Maybe it'll show up. Oh, okay. <coughs> Let's see. Bring it back up. No. Go a little bit further in now. Um, how do you do that? I'm sorry. I'm As a superintendent of public schools, you know that students who do not read proficiently by third grade are likely to drop out of school or end wow. up in jail. Well, I wonder mm -hmm. if there's, if it would be at all effective to show it on an iPad that we can't hook up. Do you think that would be or not? What do you want to do with this? On the iPad if I showed it? Well, I guess maybe we'll just we'll go on. Hopefully the next, the next video <coughs> works, yes. Got that one? Um, my apologies. The technology was working about a half hour ago, so um, <laughs> it's not working now. But the, the, the point of the video and, and what this whole transformative um, idea is about is that we know that if we don't reach children early, they really, um, unfortunately, the statistics say they drop out, end up in jail, or worse. And that the only way to get somebody reading at a third grade level is if we can really reach them at a much earlier level and progress them to the very top. That the Footsteps to Brilliance platform actually will allow the superintendent to turn on overnight every device within the city. And this is the first time ever that you have a license that is a perpetual license that can reach everybody no matter where they're at. Um, let me move on and I'm going to show you. We have a lot of data from Massachusetts, but in Napa uh, County, the data actually, where they use Footsteps to Brilliance, they had a third party uh, Toro University independent group do research. And what they found is that the children who were using Footsteps to Brilliance um, on the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test actually went from a pretest of 59% to 88%. And that was in a very short amount of time. That was in four weeks. In a more longitudinal group with 260 children, what they found is that for English language learners, at the end of their kindergarten year, when they had used Footsteps to Brilliance, 79% were actually first grade ready. And for English speakers, 98%. And it's that kind of excitement that we're seeing and it's it's that kind of data that's so important. Now hopefully I have the very first teacher who ever used Footsteps to Brilliance was a woman named Kim Floyd. Um, a group called Napa Learns called me up one day and said we want to see, th this was the group that had funded High Tech High, they said we want to see if we can use technology for children who had never been to school before and if that is actually going to make a difference. And we just, we've had great results in Napa and we just opened the first model innovation county. That means five districts have come together and they're going to be providing Footsteps to Brilliance to every child within those five districts. And hopefully this will play. Where we, mm -hmm. mm.
This was at the Model Innovation launch.
When we had the launch on February 25th, Dr. David DeRussi from Malden came to talk about his experience with Footsteps to Brilliance and um, how quickly something that is innovative was adopted by his district. So what um, Dr. DeRussi did was at about um, late September, we had a press conference to announce to the community that we were going to be uh, come that that Malden was going to become a model innovation city, and Dr. Derusi opened this up to all of the members of the community. By about October 27th, we had trained all of his schools, and at the conference, Dr. Derusi said, "I'm going to challenge." the Malden community to read one million words by, and as you can see here, December 31st, okay? So really for all practical purposes, on October 27th, the schools got trained and were ready to go. And on November 27th, the day before the schools went out for Thanksgiving, I called up Dr. DeRussi and I said, congratulations. This little widget was on his website and it moved up in real time as the children were working with the books and interacting with the words in the program. And one month early, they had read one million words. Now for all of us who are in education, we know that from Thanksgiving to January, right, you go out for Christmas vacation, oftentimes that's not a time when, um, let's say the best work goes on, or let's say a lot of work goes on in many places. I know that was certainly true for me. But I want to show you what happened. On January 10th, Dr. DeRussi asked me to address his principles. So I looked at on January 10th, which is the middle bar, at what had happened since we began. And they were already up to almost three and a half million words, had read over 7,200 books, his community. And then you see what happens is that it completely skyrockets. That by March 14th, his community had read had interacted with over 12 million words and had read over 21,000 books. But here's the really exciting part. He almost doubled the amount of time that the children spent on literacy. 53% of that time was spent in schools and a, another 47% of the time was spent during school, after school, and even on the weekend, 17% on the weekend. And this is the excitement that really changes 
things for students that you can really start getting this um, extra time on task. Now I want to tell you a little bit about how we build. At Footsteps to Brilliance, when we're part of, when you're part of a model innovation city, that means that you have a citywide literacy initiative. It's perpetual, and we're your partner. Um, we started out by building the academic language program for students because we knew that vocabulary was so important. And this series had 18 books, all of which rhymed and had alliteration. Um, and connected to this series were over 320 games. The games are specific to the book and they become assessment engines so that you can see how your children are progressing. Um, we then um, added a next series which was a STEM series and this is animal alphabets and I was really pleased when an assistant superintendent called me the other day and told me her four-year-old had told her that although penguins are birds they can't fly because they have flippers instead of wings and that's Penny the penguin. So we personalize the animal but the children really get um, to read everything. I wanted to tell you something that we also have a language toggle switch page by page in English and in Spanish. Since the research from Harvard is telling us that children who have a problem with um, being successful readers, only 10% is actually decoding and the rest is fluency and comprehension. We take the decoding skills and this is kind of like Candyland. The children go and they can really work uh, targetedly on their phonics, on their letters, on their sequencing, on their rhyming, and on their adult sight words so that they can really see themselves make progress. And we just just launched a new series of books that's very, very exciting. It's karaoke nursery rhymes, where not only do the children get to learn these rhymes, but they get to record themselves. And the rhymes are all done in different, um, in different musical genres. Connected to the books are Common Core lesson plans so that there is a roadmap for integration. And um, in addition to that, we have the professional learning community where the teachers actually share their best ideas for extending the learning beyond the computer, beyond the tablet. And everything in our system can be printed as a flashcard so that you can really make up a lot of games with it. Um, I know that you want to look at the um, financials around this at well. So I want to tell you about our contract mechanics. Remember, this is a perpetual license. We expect to be in your schools for many, 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 many years. Now the real cost of this license, based on the number of children you have, is 1.2 million. We've given several discounts for this model innovation city, bringing it down to 576,000. There is a leasing partner, and should you choose, this could be broken out into six payments of about $105,000 a year, at least when we, the, the interest rate fluctuates a little. And the key here is that the perpetual license is for, we not only have scalability, but we have to have sustainability. And as a partner, we continually add new libraries of books so that the, it stays fresh. And by the way, there's never an extra cost. You can add students. You can have transitional students. There is never an extra cost. The only cost, we, we write in a block of professional development. Normally that should last about three years. And the only thing you might want to do is add professional development after those three years. But really we want to make sure that, that there's no hidden costs for you. Now in addition, there's data analytics for accountability and student differentiation. Um, we talked about the professional learning community, the English-Spanish page toggle switch. And the key is it's unlimited access to everybody in in the Brockton zip code. So you can really get the entire community involved from those pre-K students, even if there's not room for them to go to the pre-K through to your third grade students. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this, and I would love to answer any questions if you have them. Mr. Minicello? Um, this is a, an item that 
I spoke briefly to the committee about maybe a month and a half ago, and um, I saw it basically demonstrated over at the library. And what was so impressive is how addictive, in a good way, it is to young children. They are having fun learning, and um, they're using, you know, their electronic devices. And at first, I was concerned because I was saying, well, you know, are, are all of our kids going to have the hardware at home to be able to you know, utilize this? And um, after speaking to Eileen, um, she assured me that really that's not an issue. It hasn't turned out to be an issue in many, you know, needy districts that um, somehow it always seems to work out. Um, but really what it does is that the kids don't even really the kids are having fun and they don't even realize that you know they're learning you know important lessons and especially where it, uh, where it mirrors common core it's basically I thought a very powerful tool and um, that's why I really wanted you know the rest of the committee to certainly be able to you know discuss witness and um, uh, be uh, be uh, briefed on you know this this program. Um, David Driscoll, that was the uh, former commissioner of education, um, was present. He was um, basically you know touting it as a game changer that he sees for many districts. That uh, and and he's you know not on staff. He was not being paid. He made sure that we all knew that. He just you know as a, as a lifelong educator felt that. This really is a tool that uh, can make a huge uh, difference in the lives of many students who, who are not at grade level. And, and, um, and Dr. DeRossi, who was from Malden, again, he was uh, present on a volunteer basis, just basically touting the benefits that he is, the real life benefits that he's seen it come to his community. And um, Malden, he you know, stressed, is a very multicultural community. It's not an upscale, it, it, it's not an affluent community. Um, I, I think if you compare it to Brockton, it, it might not be in our category, but it, it's certainly a community with lots of diversity. Um, so you know, he, he also felt that you know, if it benefits his community, it certainly would, would um, do a great job for Brockton. So um, I, I, th I think that you know, it's certainly a good thing that Eileen's here tonight and could answer any of your questions. It's something that we'll need to consider. It's obviously a budgetary item. We, we have, you know, we're hoping to uh, bring partners in from the business community. Um, you know, that's um, part and parcel of the, the big billboard out in front of the high school, <laughs> which I um, made fun of the mayor and um, our superintendent about. But, um, uh, you know, if it, if it reaps the results, then um, I think that uh, it certainly is a beneficial tool that um, might help our students, a big segment of our students. So. That's my two cents worth. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. I wasn't able to make the meeting, so I've been really um, anxious about learning more about the product. Um, a couple of things, I, you know, and I, I do believe that this is a great way to get kids excited about reading, getting um, exposure to more words, and, and to, to have a vehicle in which you can extend the classroom into the home, or if they're at you know, a daycare center or anything like that, the Y or extended day, anything like that. But I do have some concerns mm -hmm. um, with the population that you claim that you can reach that we can't, that we struggle with reaching in, form, in forming those relationships. In the communities that you've instituted this program, how have they been able to determine that it is reaching those hard to reach populations? What studies have they done? How have they been able to, to prove that they've reached those kids? So one of the things that's unique here is that um, every, there, there's data 
that you can look at. So you can absolutely look at your demographics and your children and see who's using it and who's not using it. And um, in Napa, for instance, it was actually migrant workers' children that were using the program. And that's where they made such terrific gains. Um, obviously, as with anything, there's professional development component. We come in as a partner, and I think you heard Kim Floyd say, you can't just, you know, you can't just hand footsteps to brilliance and say, you know, go, you know, go. But what you are doing is giving a parent if, if the child begins to um, ask, and we've seen this happen over and over again, you give the parent the tool in their hands, and now they know that they're really helping their child, whether it's in English or in Spanish, and the child is reading. If you just get into the consistent habit of 15 minutes a day, interacting with, obviously, stories and language, and in it is critical thinking skills. There's a, there's a lot, by the way, I would like to offer to everybody at the school committee here, um, if I can get your email addresses, I would be very happy to send you a certificate so that you can um, either download or go online and really use the program. And, and I hope that you would have some young children to use it with, because I think that that will show you right away just how quickly it happens. When we first launched uh, Footsteps to Brilliance two and a half years ago, um, there were many people in Napa who said that they didn't believe that technology should be used for young children, okay? This is that, that new, I mean, we, we now see the children with this all the time, and they didn't believe that it would work. And those teachers actually came into that very first um, program, it was called Summer Bridges, the teachers who were there to say, this isn't going to work. That's the reason why they were there. And they ended up being our biggest supporters. And what they said was, was very interesting. They said, first of all, they saw that every child was engaged. They don't normally see that. Um, they also said that when the children didn't know something, it wasn't a failure. The other children came and helped. But even more important is that when the children worked with this at home with their parents, they would come in and have conversations. These are four or five year old children, have conversations about the books that they liked and come see what happens here and here. There's a lot of interactivity in, in these books. And so I think that um, there is tremendous ability, there, there is a lot in this program and there's a lot of creativity in the education community and we work with that because there's many different ways to reach to reach out to the community that we're talking about. And we're experimenting with virtual pre-Ks in some places. We're experimenting with um, using transmedia so that there's some television that you you actually film your master teachers and it becomes a model for the, the parents. And then of course we work with um, Head Starts and the other um, you know extended day communities. And we do training. Uh, I don't see that as being a, a stumble block for us. I, I think our teachers realize the value that technology brings as, as a vehicle, additional vehicle to teach literacy skills and math skills and such as that. That's not my concern. Um, I feel very comfortable with that and I actually don't have an issue with the, the program at all. I think mm -hmm. it's um, any time that you can bring a new way of learning or a different vehicle of learning, you open up possibilities where a child may have a difficulty learning one way, they'll learn this way. So, you know, anytime you can, can add variety to learning styles and ways of learning, I think it's positive. My concern is honestly getting this vehicle into the hands of the kids that need it the most. And frankly, I have an 18-month-old granddaughter, okay? So I'm really excited, I'd really Great. like, and I have two, a niece and a nephew that are four. Perfect. So I have lots of experimentation that I can do with this. I'm really excited about that offer. But I also can't see myself letting these kids use my $400 iPhone to play with, okay? And that I can see it being an issue especially parents that are on it constantly. I don't know how much real time these kids are going to get on this. Somebody else is 
um, somebody else's tablet or iPad or iPhone to really make a difference at home realistically if those are the same parents that aren't taking 15 minutes to read with their kids to begin with. So, so that's, that's my fear. That's, that's, I don't see how that's going to happen even with this. So our data tracks the time that the, you know, the time of day that a child's on the system. And we even track whether or not it was the parent who signed in with their username and password or the child signed in with their, what we call a super secret code. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so the data is just there. And I think that it really is transformative. Um, I think that we could both show you it through the data, although we can't, obviously, for privacy reasons, mm -hmm. go into the individual children. But I think it, it shows it right here in this district. This is a district that has um, a lot of the same issues that many urban districts have. Mm -hmm. And you're really extending the time on task. This is, you know, evening and weekend by nearly doubling it. Mm -hmm. In these communities, how, how have you been able to reach out to like the preschool age that these kids aren't in a formal school setting yet? Is it through possibly old, old, older siblings or do you partner with daycare settings in the area? You know, how do you reach those kids? Because the pre-K is really critical. The pre-K is really critical. I agree with that. And you know, there are many different models that are being used right now. So um, in Revere, Dr. Paul Dakin, he has a capacity issue. He can't address the needs of all the people who want pre-K. So when the children register, they get a poster, uh, a, a you know, piece of paper that tells them how to register for Footsteps to Brilliance. Mm -hmm. um, he has people who outreach within the community to these, you know, parents. And um, it's interesting because his data shows that there's been as much usage with that population as there have been sometimes in his schools. So it's like he has a virtual pre-K. In Texas, we have a school that actually creates a real virtual pre-K, and this is a marvelous model, where they invite a parent or a grandparent and a child to come in once every two weeks, and they talk about um, the different ways they can help them. They show them different things and footsteps to brilliance, and then they go back. The usage there is skyrocketing. Um, I think that there's a lot of different models. In California, there's a lot more of using the television as a way to reach out as well to the parents to let them know. So we really work and support anything that's going to work in your community. And absolutely, there's training for, we can bring in and train the um, early learning workers in the, the community areas so that, and once the children see it, frankly, it sells itself. I mean, they just want it again and again and again. So it'll work on any computer, any tablet, any iPhone or iPad. Any other? Or, or Android phone. Or Android phones, okay. Mm -hmm. Or Android tablet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in just one more question, and, and then I'll, I'll relinquish the floor here. Um, in, say, Malden, okay, how many students do they have in their pre K to grade three population? Do you know off the top it's, of your It's head? around 2,000. Okay. Now, do you know the number of students that actually utilize it? out of those 2,000 students? I could get at home, not in the classroom, at home. Yeah, I could definitely get that data. I would be really interested in that, to see okay. the, the, the percentage of the students that actually utilize the program. Okay. That'd be great, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much. And I think our goal, if this is something that we do adopt, will be to work with you know, the parent academies. We've got the Adult Learning Center that has classes. We'll do outreach with all of our community partners. 
you know, that event that we actually had in February, and we've had phone calls, and Laurie can talk to you about that if you'd like to hear. You know, Trinity Catholic is asking, you know, their group if they can support it. Um, many of the daycare centers. So it would be certainly a push by the mayor and I to, you know, I want to call it a gift to the city, but we'll certainly do outreach to parents, um, our parent liaisons. It will be a push. We have our new bilingual and special ed advocacy centers coming that are going to be supported by parents. So you know, I'm trying to think off the top of my head as you, you know, mention a model. I mean, we obviously would have to come up with a model that works in our city. You know, whether it's cable, whether it's, you know, whatever connections we can get to families to make sure. Well, I did some math here of, of about 6,000 students from pre K from kindergarten through grade three, and you say you add another 1,000 pre-Ks. You're looking at a very low per student cost, mm -hmm. if you do the math. It really is. Um, so it's $88 for 7,000 kids. You're not going to just have those 7,000 kids, hopefully. That's where I think the num we really have to look at the numbers that the students are really going to reach with this. I, I think one of the things, it's such a great equalizer. I, I'm sure I can look out at everybody here that spent hours and hours reading to our children. And it probably made a difference for them as they went through school. And you know, having been there in February, and it was funny watching the presentation. I could still remember the cow and the moon and the jumping and the, you know, it, it, it was it was exciting. And you know, I I am definitely a believer. And uh, I hope it's something we can afford as a community. That's going to be mm -hmm. what we're going to have to look. Um, I think we feel very good about the connection to Common Core. Some of the things that we can certainly do in the schools after hours. I mentioned extended day. It really opens up a, another curriculum for us <clears throat> throughout the city but you know we are going to have to look at the cost yeah Tom I think that's because I added the interest charges on the <laughs> <laughs> you said, Mrs. yes I am thank you mr. Robinson uh, thank you for coming and sharing this with us um, I I mean, I think it's great. I think anything we can do in addition to what we're already doing is great, especially for those kind of most vulnerable and most in need. Um, I have some of the same kind of questions and concerns that Ms. Joyce had. Um, I'm going to try to ask them in maybe a little bit different way. Um, I, I too would be very interested in the number of eligible students versus the number who actually utilized it. So, you know, and, and not just in Malden, but it sounds like you have several communities where this is happening. I'd, I'd love to see how those numbers vary by community. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's, for example, 3,000, you know, 7,000 eligible students here, you know, what could we expect? Would 4,000 of those be a success? What, what would be our measure of success for, for utilization and what, what, would, what should be our goal? Um, mm -hmm. and, and those kinds of things, I, help, I think, help us think about that critically in terms of investment on return. Sure. Um, I'd be very interested in knowing um, how many, if, if there's a way for us to know what devices this is being used on now. So I don't know if you're able to tell if somebody's downloading it for an iPad versus downloading it for an iPhone or versus downloading it for a, a, a laptop or a desktop computer. I'd, I'd be very interested in, in knowing what kind of devices people are using and at what percentages. Um, I'd also be interested in knowing whether um, households are downloading it on multiple devices. So if one household um, has it on an iPad, an iPhone, and a desktop computer, um, so there are multiple pathways for the child to gain access, or whether or not it's um, only on mom's phone, and so mom throws it into the back seat when they're driving to school or the mall um, to keep the kid busy, or they use it at the grocery store, um, versus multiple access points multiple times that it's being utilized. I I'd be interested in knowing whether or not um, you've been able to identify particular cohorts that are having a hard time latching onto this technology. Um, whether it's a socioeconomic, uh, racial and ethnic, uh, language. Um, you know, when we talk about utilization, if you're getting 70% utilization in a community like Malden, what does the 30% look like? And, and is that 30% consistent across communities? Is it the same kind of 30%? So people, you know, below the poverty level or people that don't speak English or Spanish, or is it folks who, um, you know, single parent households? I don't know if you have any of those numbers or demographics, but it, I'd be interested in knowing are there particular cohorts that have a hard time buying in and utilizing um, over others? Um, I was wondering too, and you may not know this yet because you've only been doing this for a couple, 
couple years now. Sure, the platform um, is very new. But the secondary effects, um, are you finding or have you even looked into the fact yet uh, of whether or not this is resulting in more parents reading actual books to their kids at home? Um, or um, more kids reading books on their own outside of your technology? Does this technology engage them in reading and empower them in reading in a way that leads to them reading on more than just your app? Um, I'd be very, very interested in whether or not you've explored that or you know about that, um, and, and if you're interested in exploring that. Um, because to me, that, that would be the big win. It's, it's great that the kids who use it get the, get the words, but to me, there's, there's also something valuable lost in a parent reading to a kid versus a kid getting these words from a, a, a mobile device. It's great that they're getting it from a mobile device if they're not getting it from anywhere else, but I'd like to know or hopefully believe that at some point this would lead to more parents reading to their kid at home or more kids reading real books on their own um, outside of your device versus just your utilization. Um, and then I did have a question about the professional development too. Would our license um, include professional development for the uh, like kinder cares of the world and the YMCA's and the boys and girls clubs or would that cost come at additional? Um, like for example, could we get like a TOT model where, where our, tra our teachers or our staff or some of our folks get trained and then it enables them to train some of those community providers in the summer or, or we could stipend folks to, to do trainings um, in settings outside of our school or does the training only come from your company and that's the only way to get it and that's the best practice or that's the evaluative model or the fidelity that we have to adhere to. Um, but that aside, I think this is a great thing. I, I, I don't mean to, to kind of be presenting that I'm, I'm suspicious. I think anything we can do to expose our kids to words and language, I, we have, I have one on the way. My wife's due date is tomorrow, and we've already built our library. We have 70 books waiting for this young <laughs> boy or girl. And that's, a, that's a very, and very lucky young the, boy or girl, do we know? The first thing I plan to do is read my kid a book. That, that, um, no, no, fantastic. And, and so I understand the value and importance of it, and I understand that a lot of our kids um, aren't as lucky as, as, as I was when I was growing up and as I hope my kid will be. Um, and so anything we can do to, to create another pathway is a, is a win in my book. But those are, are some of the things that I'd love to hear more about sure. if, if you have access to that information. Okay, well let me um, try to address, I've taken some notes so I, hopefully I'll address um, some, of, some of the questions that you asked. One of the things is that we do an analysis at the end of the year. By the way, the, the Primarily, we're in Title I schools, just so that you know, yep. so that, that we're, we're really reaching, that, that's our mission here. So we're really reaching the kind of students, because um, truthfully, the United States is in crisis when you see that, you know, that number of children are entering kindergarten. We know at the other end, it's the same thing. We're losing 40% of our children. So um, one of the analysis we do is we look at the exposure to words. Now, Hart and Reesley talks about the 30 million word gap. We've all heard that. But when you actually read their, their research, they also say that an at-risk child hears, on average, 615 words per hour. Um, an affluent child hears, on average, 2,150 words per hour. When we do the analysis, our children are hearing on average 2,500 words per hour. Okay, we're beating out Beverly Hills, if you will, which is very exciting. The other thing is about diffusion of innovation. And one of the things is that um, we have studied very much the, there's over 5,000 studies now on the best way to diffuse innovation. And, and in all the different companies we've worked with, we've talked about that kind of outreach. And just so you know, there's a curve that takes place. Um, you first have your, um, uh, your early adopters, right? And then and that's going to normally be about 12 to 15 percent. And then you have your next um, cohort that's about 25 percent, then 25 to 30 percent. Then you have your next cohort, which is going to be, you know, bring you up to about 80 percent. And there's always going to be some resistors and rejectors. And so we have to make sure that, that we understand that. And, and you know, th there's always going to be. Those folks are. Yeah. So what happened today is that um, Dr. Dakin in, in Revere started um, 
last year, so he's in his second year. And I went to visit him today since I was in the area. And I looked at what his data said from last year. And just so that you know, um, I did it last year up until it was April 3rd that I um, actually took screenshots of his data so that we would be comparing apples to apples. And at this time last year, without going into all the different data points, his students had interacted with 10,437,000 words. And before I turned the page to say to him, you know, let's look at what's happened now, and this is the excitement. This is the excitement that happens. I said to him, well, what do you think you're going to find? You know, is your data, do you think you're going to have more usage, less usage? He said, well, I'd be very happy if we grew by 15%. And when I turned the page, he had gone from 10 million words to 20,222,000 words within that same time period, which was really very exciting. And, and what you're seeing is each year, it builds and builds and builds on itself. Um, in terms of the professional development, absolutely. I think that, um, first of all, this is a um, system that is easy to use. We can train teachers in about three hours. We have roadmaps for the teachers. Um, and if you want to do train the trainer models or anything like that, we're happy. I mean, our goal, this is, this is what makes this so transformative. Our goal isn't to say you can't. Our goal is to say, give us your best and let's do it together. Um, so absolutely, we're, we're, th we're thrilled with that. Now, that having been said, we keep adding to this program. And so obviously our trainers know the program inside and out in a way that others won't. But they can explore it and learn it on their own as well. Our professional development also, um, every two weeks, the teachers get emails from our um, head of professional development so that both they can um, look at data together, they can ask questions, we're really here. And something else that is actually a very big cost that is not something that uh, is factored in when, and I thank you very much, Ms. Joyce, for looking at that per student cost, which really is incredibly we're trying to make this reasonable. It's really incredibly reasonable because we know what goes into, you know, the working daily with our technical team, the adding new data, the working with our curriculum team. Um, but, um, no, I forgot where I was going. If somebody could <laughs> remind me, I apologize. Um, but what I was going to say is that it's really something that becomes truly a cost-effective way to reach people, and that's it, it's it's mission driven here, in this part. And I for, there was another point I was going to make, but it will come to me. Yeah, you can't write the book. Sorry. I think it was. No, let me just think. What I was going to say. <laughs> It'll come back. It will come back. Eileen mentions the partnership with Revere. I've actually been there a year ago and saw Footsteps to Brilliance for the first time. Uh, Dr. David DeRussi in Malden. Right now, the superintendent in Lemonster, Jim Jolliker, came out in February when we were viewing Footsteps to Brilliance. I know Fitchburg, Andre Ravenel is looking at it, and I think Norton Public Schools. So, you know, Massachusetts is starting to look at this, and, uh, you know. Hopefully we'll have the same success as Revere if we're able to adopt. One of the exciting things that they're thinking about in Fitchburg, we had the, the, the meeting, is um, they have the uh, state university there, Fitchburg State, and they have teacher training that work with the schools. So we're going to be making Footsteps to Brilliance available to them, and they're going to be have their teachers in training actually work with the schools. I mean, it's really exciting what you can do we're, when, when there are no limitations. There were literally no limitations. Okay. All set. Mr. Henderson, thank you very much for coming tonight. 
I, I think it's just an excellent program. Um, my son, who was seven, uses a program now called Lexier, and he's making you know tremendous strides in his reading comprehension, and it's just it's it's fantastic what we've been able to see in that. I just have a couple questions. Sure. Um, you know, it is a it is a costly um, you know endeavor for for any school system to to undertake. Um, but on that, um, how does this program help? Uh, we have population um, in that in that demographic of special needs kids, for example. So, how would how would this program um, enhance their uh, process uh, and of learning? And um, you know, as as a parent, another question I had was, you know, um, as my son you know progresses through his reading skills and whatever, he gets excited. But is there a way that is there some sort of achievement certificate or something like that that I can print out and hang on the you know refrigerator to? you know thank him you know in, in that way to say great job um, the third question I have is uh, do parents have access to the metrics that um, to see how their child is progressing um, you know I, I one of the things that that I don't get is I mean I can watch my son do it um, but I'd like to be able to see the the metrics behind it and to see how many words he's actually doing and how he's progressing without having to you know ask the teacher for that specific information so I can become more involved as, as a as a you know parent in this process and then you know obviously we want to reach as many kids as we can uh, in this demographic too uh, one of the things we have is a large population of Cape Verdean and the Haitian population so have there been any thoughts on you know having additional languages other than Spanish okay good questions all of them let me take the first one which is the special needs and with respect to the special needs um, the, the, the key to this, what, what people have said, it's kind of like almost finger pa painting for the children. It's such a natural thing. You're utilizing all their senses. But I'll give you a specific because this woman has actually blogged about us and, and I could also send you the blog. Um, two years ago, um, we got a lot of publicity for the work we did in NAFA. This was, believe it or not, mobile technology was so completely new. I mean, even the concept of having a curriculum where you could get data from, you know, a, a tablet was really groundbreaking. And we like to be, we like to be cutting edge and we stay cutting edge. Um, and a woman read about us and said she had a problem. She had a child, his name was John, and he was autistic and ADHD. And she said that he loved books. She had read to him. He loved books. But when he got into school, the way that his brain was wired made him uh, unsuccessful in learning himself how to read. And so as his reading scores went lower and lower, his self-esteem self was shrinking too. And she was very nervous about that. So we, um, we gave her the entire program. And this was over the summer. We didn't actually expect her to be as, um, it's a brave new world actually, the, the people that we meet as we come in. And I remember now what I was going to say. Um, and we didn't expect her to really communicate, but weekly she'd communicate. And she told us that John loved Footsteps to Brilliance so much that she was threatening to take it away if he didn't do his chores, which we loved, you know, we'd high five each other. And then she told us that, you know, he never could be independent before. He always, he wanted to read books, but he always had to ask somebody to read for him. Suddenly he's independent, he loved it. But the real breakthrough came in week three or four when she wrote us and said that we have a lot of, uh, connected to these books, there are games that really are targeted skill for vocabulary, critical thinking skill, creating your own books. And he loved one on comprehension, it's called Book Buddies. But what he found, and this was so exciting, was that he couldn't get a high score if he didn't read the book first. What an incredible breakthrough. Um, and then at the end, he had gone to a summer school that was really, as she said, you know, a continuation of what had gone on during the school year. And they did a pretest and they did a post test. And for the first time ever, he actually had a 20% gain. And she actually sent that to us so that we could see it. Fast forward 
every so often I just call her to find out how John's doing. John's now mid-level reading. And this is a child who certainly, you know, had many special needs. So um, because of this, other people with autistic children have heard about this, have come in. We oftentimes, if it's a onesie twosie, we'll give the program to them. And I'm always told that this is the best program that their children have ever had, that their children really gravitate towards it. So um, I just think that this whole using so many senses makes such a difference. And the fact that we contextualize what the kids read about makes a big difference too. Certificates, it's funny that you said that. In that first summer that we were there, um, the teacher said, you know, this is great, but I'd like a black and white certificate that we could print out and give it to the child that they can color in and hang, you know. And so um, we had our designers, and it's right in the program, build things, I was brilliant today, you know, whatever. And, and there's about six of those, and those could be printed out. Um, however, our longer range term, and remember, as your partner, the beauty of, of, of technology is it's an iterative process. We see what works, we see what doesn't work, we add things. Um, we're not putting a cap on your license. We're not putting a cap on what you get for this. And um, so in, in terms of that, there's a bigger picture here. Um, we're in the process of designing it where the children really are going to be getting um, banners that really will show them their progress. And we're, so anyway, that's a bigger picture. And there's a lot of things we're working with simultaneously, but that definitely is in the program because we know how important that is. In terms of the parents seeing the, the data for their children, we've set up a whole section that I call it the candy land, where the children actually see their progress, but the parents also see their progress. And this candy land doesn't just go to did they play a foundational game, it goes to did they master it. And we have different levels that show that. So in level A, we're actually kind of teaching the child the skill. They, they hear it, they see it. In level B, we take away some of that support and see if they can do it, but they don't progress unless they get 80%. If they get 80% without a hint, they can get the star, but if not, they go on to level C. Level C, they've got to do it on their own until they get that mastery, they don't go on. So that you really know that the children have gotten the practice that they need, you know, like anything else, right? I was. I was a pianist, right? And my mother used to say, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, <laughs> practice. It makes a difference if you're an athlete, if you're a reader. It's that time on task. So. And yeah, and, and the, like I said, the only other question I had was just the languages. Oh, the languages. So we built the system so that we can add languages. Let me tell you that it's no easy feat adding languages. There is truly tremendous costs. We've made the commitment to the English-Spanish because that's a very important thing in the United States today. We are very happy to add languages if somebody wants to pay for it. But let me tell you that every time we do quality control, we're doing quality control not just in English, we're doing it in Spanish, we're doing it on every single device. Um, and, it, and, and the other thing that I will tell you with languages is that you never please everybody uh -huh. in languages. You never please everybody with the translation. But we get pretty close. I mean, people have told us that they, they, they like the translations, but I've used like six translations. I finally found one who I think is just a gem. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it can be done. The answer is yes. Because yeah, it's, it's it, going to, to what Mr. Robinson said, you know, I mean, we, we want to reach, you know, we want to see those metrics on, on how many people are actually reached. And, and I don't know Malden's demographics, um, but Brockton's demographics, we have an incredibly diverse community. And, and, you know, to make a large investment, whether or not the business community or, uh, you know, uh, the school uh, makes that commitment, we want to make sure that we're making the best investment of our, of our money and reaching as many kids as possible because th yeah this this can provide children with that wonderful opportunity of reading and and you know yeah just like you said the studies have shown you know over and over again the the, the educational success that, that kids will get from that so it's kind of important for, for myself and probably a lot of people in the city absolutely thank you thank you Fuck.
coming. Thank I, you. I, I agree with the other members. You know, anything that we can add to help our kids out, you know, technology is definitely a big thing and they need to learn it early on. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, I have the same type of um, budgetary concerns, but I also have a couple of questions about um, the programming development. Um, the current platform that the program um, runs on is it give a lot of build out options you know for adding books different levels you know can you build upon the levels if a student reaches say that level C is that the last level that they reach or can they continuously progress or are they stuck with the same um, books um, and also um, as far as the word count does that count for each book that they've read or if they read the same book over and over and over again does it continuously count those words um, and also I have the same um, concerns like right with the language obviously Brockton's very diverse and has many different language groups so you know is there a potential for that in the future or is it just good? So we've made the commitment to English and Spanish. We can definitely add any language, but the cost would, you know, I, I mean, if, if an individual district says that this is my need, that's not the need, you know, universally in the United States. So we would be more than happy to, but there, you know, you would be paying the cost for it, is what I'm saying yeah. for that. But um, with respect to, I think, the other questions you asked, um, we have done a lot of very unique things technologically, and one is we have the most incredible authoring tools. And with those authoring tools, we are constantly developing new libraries of books based on different needs. And, um, and so the answer is that those books are going to keep showing up. And, and, and it's a very, it becomes a very exciting dynamic product because of that. And so that's part of the uh, commitment that we have. But with those authoring tools, I will tell you, um, I, will, I will tell you something. We had a meeting in um, Lynn today, and a lot of the teachers had really done their homework. They had, um, they had looked at the program. They gave us wonderfully, wonderful feedback, I have to say, having really looked at it, but one, of their curriculum, that when I say teachers, one of their uh, heads of curriculum said that she had looked at our Dutch sight word game. It's called Whack a Word. And in the second grade, and, and for those of you who know Dutch, Dutch actually developed 220 words that he said children need to learn by sight, and he divided them. This is what you need 50 at pre K, 70 at first grade, whatever. So believe it or not, one of the words in second grade is Santa Claus. And I have to say, unbeknownst to me, as much of the quality control as we do every so often, something does slip through. She said, you know, I'm surprised because Santa Claus was spelled as one word, S-A-N-T-A-C-L-A-U-S. So I said to her, really? Well, let me look at that and I will tell you that it will be corrected within an hour. And I called my office and I said, check out Santa Claus, second grade word. Sure enough, she was correct. It was changed. I sent an email and said, please update, you know, just there's a little button, update your, and you're going to see that Santa Claus is now spelled correctly. What I'm trying to say is that we're really working with you. We have authoring tools to really be iterative to your needs, and that's why we built it this way. We did a lot with the platform and with the way that we can interact with the platform. Even before we started building content. And this is important because, frankly, in other, this is my third education technology company, in other companies, you really couldn't do that with a product that's as multimedia as, as this one is. You, you just didn't have the ability. And so we've built something that we think is, is pretty unique in that respect and allows us to partner. being able to sample the um, model so we'll all provide well our able-bodied assistant Wanda has all of our emails so she can um, provide those to you Eileen and as soon as you can that would be great so that we could all play around and Mrs. Joyce can play with her 
nieces and nephews. Or? And, and that will be my real pleasure. And, and please give me feedback. If you have any questions, please feel free. That's, that's what the partnership's all about. By the way, and that's what I was going to say. Part of what is not built into this product and perhaps answers your question in part is that I have had to bring on a team of people, frankly, to address the calls from parents because sometimes, and, and they're in English and in Spanish. <laughs> so we have a lot of calls that we're getting, which shows you um, fr from the demographic you're talking about that we walk through, oftentimes it's because, frankly, it's, it's because they don't know yet how to really use the system. And we have very patient people who talk them how to you know, just use an iPad. <laughs> That type of thing. That, that's that's. Not, I mean, if it got, you know, overwhelming, there comes a point. But, but we're really talking about changing something here. And so it's a cost that you don't see, but, but I do see. Thank you very much. And also, I think I'd like to follow up with Deputy Superintendent Liz Barry, and maybe we can take a look at some of our curriculum people and possibly uh, have them take a look at it also. I, w I would be very pleased. And. Again, thank you so much. Um, it is a pleasure to be here, and um, I hope that we will be working together. I look forward to it if we do. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. And next uh, on the list is uh, one of my favorite, and I think all of yours too. We've been committed to bringing uh, our schools, uh, our partners, uh, organizations, and tonight we have the Adult Learning Center. Uh, Suzanne Martin, our coordinator, and Kathy Quinn, our assistant supervisor at the Adult Learning Center are going to come up and talk to you a little bit about uh, what we have at the Adult Learning Center. I think you know that we have the um, citizenship classes. We just graduated, I think it was over 20, uh, about a month or two ago, uh, GED candidates. Our uh, ESOL classes, our uh, ABE classes, our adult basic education. So Suzanne, um, take it away and Thank you very much. I, PowerPoint or? No. <laughs> we could do that right now if you want us to. <laughs> Thank you for inviting us here tonight. Uh, Kathy and I just want to give you an overview of uh, what we do at the Adult Learning Center. Some of you have been to the Adult Learning Center and been to our graduations and um, some of you are new to us and happy to be here to talk about our school. Uh, the, the Adult Learning Center, you also have some information in your packets, I'm sure um, you've had a chance to see. And we've been in Brockton for over 40 years. We're a part of the uh, community school program. And our, we work with adults and um, who are 16 years and older. However, we work with very, very few 16-year-olds or even 18-year-olds. That's not our target population. Uh, we have GED preparation, what used to be GED preparation. Traditionally, people know it as that. Um, English for speakers of other languages, we call it ESOL. And we do adult basic skills. As um, Superintendent Smith mentioned, we also have citizenship classes. We have uh, family learning classes. We have a pre-K program, and I see that um, Principal uh, Helen Berger is here tonight. She's been very helpful, and this year in a transition from a special ed class to a regular pre-K class in our school. And we also um, have offered a lot of other classes, uh, workplace education classes. We have a class at the Career Center uh, now. We've had that for about 10 years now for English for employment. And we do a lot of referrals uh, for our students. So one of the things that is most, I think the most connection to the schools is our family connections class. And I just want to ask Kathy to speak a little bit about what we do in that program. Okay. Um, Eileen couldn't have set me up better because it's the perfect segue into my talking to you about the family connections classes that we offer at the Learning Center. And one of the quotes that I took from her PowerPoint said, parents' involvement in, in their child's education is the major determinant of their success in school. And this really highlights the importance of the family connections classes that we offer at the Adult Learning Center. 
The curriculum is contextualized specifically for the parents of Brockton Public Schools children. The lessons focus on the literacy and language skills that they need to become active participants in their children's education. And the materials that we use in those classes um, are often documents that come through the Brockton Public Schools and are sent home to their children, or um, even items that the parents find in the children's backpacks and they don't understand what they are and so they bring them in and they ask their teachers to explain them to them. Um, the topics that are addressed in these classes range from how to develop the strategies to have a successful parent-teacher conference, how to write an, a letter of um, absence, how to read and understand the rubrics that go along with the MCAS reports or with assignments that they're giving at school, how to read and understand Brockton Public Schools report cards, um, knowing when to um, advocate for your children, um, and of course activities that stimulate the intellectual curiosity of their, chi of their kids. Um, and this is done in addition to our regular ESL curriculum which includes reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And so we feel that by encouraging the parents to become involved in their children's education um, we, and aligning our curriculum to the Corman Core State Standards, that we really are partnering with every single school in our district. And right now we have 400, um, our parents are, our students are parents to 444 Brockton Public School students. Um, although many of them are still working on getting their high school diploma, they're setting a wonderful example for their children by um, showing them the value of education by continuing to come to school themselves. Um, and this is evidenced by when you look at um, 20 of the recipients of the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship are children of parents who attended the Brockton Adult Learning Center. So. That's a little overview. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, one of the, at least the year that I looked at it, which I believe was last year's um, Adam Scholars, one of those children um, started with us in the pre-K class. So we started, you know, at the Adult Learning Center, whatever, how many years ago that was, and continued on. And also her brother was an Adam Scholar who also started with us a couple of years before she did. So um, that that's really indicative, I think, of what an impact early pre-K can do where the parents are the active partners in our school. The parents come to school four days a week. There are 15 children enrolled in the pre-K class. So the parents take a core, a core academics course twice a week and then two other days they meet as a parent group with an instructor and they um, are often in the classroom working with the, with the teachers in the classroom. So a little bit about our funding. We are um, very well supported and thankful to the Brockton Public Schools for uh, all of the um, monetary funding and also in-kind support. We have an absolutely wonderful building at the Payne School that I hope you'll all have a chance to come over and visit. Uh, but our, our biggest funding comes from the Department of Education Adult Basic Education Grant and we also have a significant grant with Brockton Area Workforce Investment Board which is uh, indirectly through the Department of Education also. Over the years we've had many other grants. Um, um, I w was here t this evening because I'm applying for a citizenship grant and other contracts with businesses. Um, we've had contracts with the Chamber of Commerce. We work closely with Massasoit. Community College, um, Harbor One, which I know has been a great partner for the schools also. And I think one of the significant things that people ask about at the Adult Learning Center is what's with that waiting list? And it's it is huge, it's significant. There isn't much that we can do about it. Um, we refer all over the place. In your packet you'll see that we have, uh, currently have over 1,500 people waiting for classes in Brockton, and most of those people are waiting for English language classes. We have uh, addressed some of the adult basic education and high school equivalency classes by offering, um, by receiving a grant for a distance learning program, and it is 
uh, new to us. It is somewhat successful, but not everyone has the internet connection and capability that we had hoped. So that's a growing um, group, and we hope that that will address some of the problems with people waiting on a waiting list for GED preparation classes, probably six months to a year. Uh, for English language classes, we actually tell people that the wait will be almost two years to get into the Brockton Public Schools Adult Learning Center. So uh, we also refer people to the community schools program, which does have an evening English language program, but there is a cost to that, which is prohibitive for some of our waiting students. So I wanted to, this evening just to t spend a few minutes talking about the change to the GED, because I think that um, people ask about that, and it's uh, not particularly well known what's going on in Massachusetts with, the, with what was the GED program. Uh, GED, many of you may know, was a program that was started um, shortly after World War II for returning veterans who had left school to, in order to get a high school, so that they could get a high school credential when they came back. That uh, GED test was uh, run through a nonprofit organization. It was um, it changed over the years to keep up with the times. It did they did change curriculum change to go with that. It was always normed on high school seniors, so the curriculum did have to keep up with what high school seniors were able to do. Um, however, a couple of years ago, uh, the GED testing service sold that product. Uh, and that went into effect just a, uh, about a year ago to Pearson, uh, another a for-profit company. So that left the states, every state, in a situation where you can't just go with the one company. So it went out to a bid. In, in Massachusetts, what that meant was there were a number, there are a few, probably five now, companies that came out with a high school equivalency test. All of them are purport to be uh, aligned with the Common Core. They're changing in much the way that our testing for our pre-K to 12 is changing. They're keeping up with those styles of testing, online testing. Um, so what Massachusetts chose to do was to go with a test that's called the high set. I assume that means high school equivalency test. And that test is, uh, going to start soon in Brockton. They just started testing in Massachusetts uh, over the last week or so. And so there has been no test given in Massachusetts since December. We're hoping that before the end of the school year, we will have a, t a test given locally at Massasoit. And right now, our students would have to travel to the Cape, or they might have to go into Boston if they were going to test. So we do not have anybody testing at the current time. The test is going to cost $100. There are other ways you can pay for that, different fee, but the, the best deal for your money is to take the $100 option and to um, try to get through the test that way. It is all only going to be given online in, in, um, at Massasoit. There are other places where you can still take a paper pencil test. Uh, that's a challenge for our adults. Um, as you know, many of our students are second language learners. And uh, right, this is a timed test. So they have 45 minutes to type, not only write, compose, think about, organize, and then type an essay. Um, that's, that is definitely a challenge. So the high set that's out now is the state has taken a contract with this company for three years. And that over the, this is kind of a way for us to ease into the new style of testing, which will um, be much more rigorous and given in a different format. So uh, we are encouraging students to, if they can, get ready to take this test and take the high set as soon as it is available. And we are trying to um, make spaces available in our classes as much as possible so that we can help people to prepare for that. So that's um, pretty much what's happening. It will be changing. And interestingly, um, not all states went this way. Almost uh, many, many, many states stayed with the GED through Pearson. A number of states went with a test that is uh, was put out by McGraw Hill, and some states went with all three 
it's confusing enough to prepare people for one. I don't know how they're doing preparing people for all three tests. But uh, Massachusetts chose this one exclusively. And the test, you do not get your high school diploma because you passed the high set. You get your high school diploma because the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education issued you a diploma an alternative diploma. So it is up to each state to decide which test they will use as the benchmark for um, showing high school equivalency. So uh, that was pretty much what I wanted to tell you this evening. And uh, I also wanted to acknowledge that we are working with the mayor's office on trying to get something available through cable access for um, some of the people who are on our waiting list to do some programming that might allow them to at least have some access while they're waiting for programming. So thank you very much. Thank you. Just a couple questions. So you mentioned that you assist parents with various um, processes um, to help, you know, facilitate their children's education. Are one of those processes the the IEP process, for example? Or do you help them understand how to navigate that process? We don't specifically do that. We have advisors for uh, both day and evening uh, available to this to the, to the parents. But we also work very closely with the Parents Academy, with the special ed department, and we make referrals because we are certainly not the experts in that. And there are um, lots of resources for people. What we do help with is to, for the parents to know why they're going into a meeting, what that meeting's about. I think that the schools do an excellent job of making sure that there are language um, interpreters for them. And, I, and there are really good organizations in the city that support um, parents who are, are working with IEPs, I think. And then you mentioned, so Pearson is now going to be in charge of the GED testing? Yes, but not the Massachusetts test. Not the Massachusetts right. test. It's ETS. ETS is the um, company that has put out the high set test. Okay, so the test is going to be, you said, given at Massasoit. It's not going to be given any time in the future at like a testing center. Massasoit has been the local testing center, and they opted to continue testing with the new test. The state is open to having other testing centers. Right now, uh, Massasoit has been able to keep up with the demand, so I'm not sure um, if people would be interested. It's an expensive process yeah. to have a lab up and running uh, yeah. to be testing at the demand that they need. And the only other thing I'd say, just a comment, I, I, I hope that there's ways that, you know, through grants or other additional funding that we can kind of help alleviate some of that backlog for waiting lists. I know that's a concern of many parents that, that want to learn English and want to partake in their child's education. They just aren't, aren't given the opportunity because of the cost prohibitive nature of some of them. Right. I, I would like to mention that, um, thank you for that, we, we would also like that, yeah. um, but there are two schools in the, in the city that are, are using their grant, some of their grant money to, do, to alleviate some of, the, some of that, and um, one is we work closely with the Huntington School, and um, I know that um, June Saber has been before you with some of her parents who have gone through their program. We help them to run a daytime and an evening English language class for parents of Huntington students, and we are currently uh, working with East Middle School. We have a class, last year the class was at East Middle, two classes there. This year the classes are actually at the Payne School with us, and we ha those classes are exclusively for parents of children who go to East. Thank you. Thanks. Mrs. Joyce. Um, thank you for the report. It, it's, it's always nice to learn about what's going on in the Adult Learning Center. Um, the wait list, though, that's, that's <laughs> a big thing. And is it strictly a funding issue, or do you have facility issues as well? No, we have a wonderful facility. <laughs> and we no, have but I mean, if you could, if you had the funding for all of these people on the wait list, would you have the space for them? We would have, we have, 
space now and our grant is less than it was a few years ago where we have uh, 400 over 400 students now a couple of years ago we had 600 students and we were able to accommodate them but also uh, for evening classes we're very comfortable at Brockton High School um, and some of the other schools have made space available in the evening okay. daytime obviously we would need to stay in our own home right, base. right. Mm -hmm. But it's really the, the reason that the people are on the wait list is because of funding. It's funding. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have, a, I have a couple questions, if I could. Um, well, first of all, Carmen, I appreciate you mentioning the, the program we're working on together. So. Um, the person in my office who's communications director is also BCA liaison, Nubi Rateau. So he's working with the folks at uh, the Adult Education Center on actually producing a, a series for cable access television that will be available free of the ESL classes as one of our potential solutions to this two-year wait that it, it's not a substitute for a live class, but it certainly would be a learning tool that would help people while they were waiting at no cost. So we're, I know we're not quite there yet, but we're working on it and, and uh, we're, we're very excited about the, the prospects of it. Um, around the family connections now, is it two schools that you said that we're doing the program at now? Yes. East, well, East is being done at the Payne School now? Right. And Huntington. Right. Were we doing Raymond at one time or no? The bilingual, I, I believe that's out of the bilingual department. Okay, so it's done but yes. not through this. Mm -hmm. Okay. We had a grant and uh, had it at the Raymond School. And that would have been for parents throughout the district to right. attend. Um, so when I looked at the material that you handed out, um, talk about adults at the Adult Learning Center, countries of origin, it, it looks like Haiti and Cape Verde are pretty much mm -hmm. <laughs> close to even 50-50 right. in terms of the uh, where the people are coming from that are taking the ESL classes. Um, but in terms of the family connections, are both of those programs in Cape Verdean Creole? No, everything at the Adult Learning Center is in English. It's not a bilingual program. The one from East? Right. It's taught in English. Okay. So what is so it's teaching English? You got you lost me then now. So so they're you know, certainly they're speakers of other languages and as you said, the largest population is Cape Verdean Creole, mm -hmm. uh, French Creole for our Haitian mm -hmm. uh, population, but when they come to the adult learning center and the children, everything is, is spoken in English. They go through different levels. That's correct. Um, you know, as they progress they okay. certainly have so a So you're knowledge. able to serve parents from both Cape Verdean Creole and Haitian Creole. Right. Okay. We we have six levels of English language wow. classes. Okay. So if someone is a beginner speaker of there may be five different languages in that beginner class. Okay. So it is not now I've got you. taught in dual languages, it's taught in English. And it's is that different than how it's done down at the Huntington School? No, it's the same. It's same more of an immersion um, approach okay. to English. And what I'm curious as to why um, the one for the East parents is done over at the Payne School. This year with the funding at East, we were only going to be able to offer one class through um, what they were able yeah. to do for this year. So it would have meant one class alone in that um, building and it wouldn't okay. have left enough room for differentiation. So those students who maybe we're need a beginner class can be... So the parents are better served by coming over to the, to the pain. We can put them in a available. class that's appropriate with yeah. other parents. Okay, no, that, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, and in terms of the... Um, the high set test, so basically what we've always known as GED is now high set. Right. And it has to be taken online at Massasoit. No. It can be, you can still take a paper and pencil test for the, at least for the first year. Okay. Uh, I know that Cape Cod Community College is offering that and a number of the centers in Boston are going to be offering that. in terms that. of locally? Locally, no. Okay. So do we have any capability to have um, practice exams to, to get, you, you mentioned that some some of the students may have a bigger challenge adapting to taking the test online. 
do we have any capability for, is there such a thing as a practice high set test that they can yes. practice online? Right, and we have purchased those okay. for practice. Um, unfortunately, because high set was not on anybody's radar screen, the uh, materials are just starting to come out, so we're being a little bit conservative in what we spend right. until we see what those materials really look like. Yeah. But the, uh, the practice test, obviously students need to do that before they go over to take that yeah. test. And do you, do you have a guess as to what, on average, the students' pass success rate is when they go over to take the test? They haven't given it yet. Oh, they haven't so, given it yet. Okay. So we don't right. know. So but this is really new. No, but they are claiming 97% of the students who take the new high set are passing. Really? Oh, Where the GED was 67%. Oh, okay. So right. the word is to go and take it now. Yeah, like absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it, one of our concerns about the high set is it's only going to be in effect for three years, and then they're going to be deciding upon another. Yes. So it's just a transition period for the next, now it's two and a half years. Right. Well, I really appreciate you coming tonight and talking about the programs. I think particularly in a, in a city like Brockton, on the school committee was so focused on, you know, we think of the, our 17,000 plus students <laughs> that we serve, but we, I think, also serving the adult students in the community is a critical role. So I certainly appreciate everything that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so and much. And I wish that um, I had, we did not record, and I wish that we had our graduation in February, which was, we did a very fast paced September to December, hurry up and get your GED before something, you know, before we didn't know what was going to happen in December. So we had 20 students who graduated, who started in September, and who were able to graduate by December. And we celebrated with them in February. And one of, there were two young men sitting who should obviously have been at school at 11.30, 12 o'clock in the morning. So when I went to ask them why they were there, and they said that it was more important, they were going to learn more by watching their mother walk across that stage. That's what she told them. <laughs> so I thought that was really, they they got a pass that day, I thought. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. And as they leave, um, you know, one of the best ceremonies, uh, actually there are four ceremonies, um, and I know you're invited to every one of them. I know what your time is like, but if you have an opportunity to get to any of the graduation ceremonies at the Adult Learning Center, when you talk about six levels and you watch somebody that came in at level one and they're the graduation speaker, and they talk to you about what a difference it has made in their lives, it's certainly worthwhile to go. And mayor, they love when the mayor of the city comes, Okay. and uh, expresses an interest in their citizenship, their involvement, and it's just a great opportunity. So thank you to everybody at the Adult Learning Center. And it's a great segue for me to talk to you uh, about a couple of things that are happening. The mayor and I have spoken often about this. Um, one of the things with the strategic plan, and I'll start with that first, is we've gone from being a transition team into our strategic planning. We actually had our second meeting uh, on April 2nd. We had had over 30 of our educators and it spanned the bilingual department, the special education department, all different levels coming together to work in the four groups that I shared with you during our transition team. And we're starting to develop and come to a consensus on a vision, a mission. Uh, we'll be working with you on a school committee goal to be part of this. We're talking about our core values. We're starting to break up into our four groups now and meet separately and come up with our strategic plan with our strategic objectives, our initiatives, our key actions, and we'll be ready to share that with you sometime in June. On May 6th, I'd like to share with you the entry plan, which are all the different groups I've had an opportunity to meet with, and pretty much the direction that the, that the community, our educational community, our parents, uh, our administrators, our teachers would like to see us going in the next uh, three to five years. So there's a lot of work going on, and I will tell you how good it felt on April 2nd with all of your staff there talking about the ownership of the strategic plan and feeling really good that this is something that they're going to develop. 
And also what came out of that, and as I said, the mayor and I have you know, talked very often about this, is we actually have a group, and it will be a group from your administrative interns, and it will be a special project for the superintendent, and it's all about cultural proficiency. It's going to be addressing a lot of the things that Suzanne and Kathy just talked to you. Uh, Dr. Moran will be heading that up and working with this group. We've met with them a number of times. We're looking at professional development when we talk about cultural proficiency to really talk about some of the different groups that we're, that we're dealing with, some of the things that are particular to their culture. We're talking about during new teacher orientation. We're talking about working with the Parent Information Center. When you talk about SEI, when you talk about grading and report cards, when you talk about curriculum, you talk about state assessments, you talk about camps. We all understand this. It's part of our everyday life. Think about coming here for the first time and you go into a parent registration center. So we're looking at ways to support our bilingual community. We've been over to the Adult Learning Center and they're very gracious to have shared a couple of rooms with Deputy Superintendent Thomas and myself and we're going to be having, as we told you, a parent advocacy center with our special ed department and our bilingual department and it's going to be staffed by parents. It's going to be parents coming up with things that they want to share you know, with our community. So that's something very fast that we'll be approaching. Um, again, Dr. Moran and I hear you loud and clear uh, about growing your own model and it isn't just for teachers, it's for paraprofessionals, it's for MTAs, it's for custodians, it's all about recruitment. So when I have talked to you about working with the, and you've been so great about the communications office, so we're looking at this bilingual person, you know, able to do much more, putting information out on the website, looking at volunteering for our parents. So I hope a year from now that when we're talking about our strategic plan in full bloom and we're talking about a number of these initiatives, we're seeing a different Brockton Public Schools as we go into the future. So that was a great segue to, to share with you uh, anything about the strategic uh, team now or where we're headed. And my other thing I'd like to talk to you about tonight is PARC. So PARC was field tested and we'll actually be coming before a subcommittee. I think we'll be talking about some of those dates to do a debriefing with you. Uh, we got through the first round. Um, I was out at the Hancock School uh, looking at, and again, when people are talking about this, this is a test that we need to be a part of the field testing. As painful as some of it has been with you know, making sure our technology is in line, making sure our you know, kids are prepared for the field testing, it gives us an eye into the window to see what is happening with park. So out there, uh, the kids, it, it seemed seamless some days. I'm told other days there were a number of glitches that we needed to see. You had a wonderful team with technology, with your administrators at Central out there working day in and day out to support the children that were field testing park. So we will have um, you know, a bigger debriefing for you to tell you about the man hours, to tell you where we stand with technology. We have concerns. You know, the technology that we told you about at the Raymond School, at the Hancock School, we need throughout this district. So we will have one more year, I believe, of field testing before a decision is made at the state level. But believe me, we have a voice. I have an urban superintendent meeting in May. I'm bringing the team from Brockton, uh, Dr. Cancel, uh, Liz Barry, to really talk about what we saw out there during you know, the past couple of weeks of field testing. So we'll be happy to be reporting that to you very soon when we come up with a, a date for a curriculum subcommittee. Yeah. On the park, uh, field testing. There was an article in um, the Globe recently okay. where, and I, I don't know if you happened to catch it, but for the most part, the feedback that they were getting from the communities, and I don't know if they just picked communities that had negative feedback, was very, very negative. And um, is that what you're finding, or was the article skewered towards what they not, wanted to? I'm not sure if you're talking about there. the Boston Globe educators give option to skip test. Is yeah. that kind of? Uh, I'm not going to say that we're negative at this point. We feel like we're learners. Mm -hmm. You know, we're having an opportunity to look over uh, the shoulders of kids actually testing. You know, Liz Barry and I were at the Hancock today, and they were doing a makeup test, mm -hmm. and we were talking about how difficult it is for our kids that you know, haven't seen some of the way the test items, uh, I believe it was fractions we were looking at, Liz. And our kids are competent to certainly go into a text box mm -hmm. and explain the solving of a math problem. 
but we hadn't had an opportunity to explain how they would answer you know with this web-based test so yeah. we have concerns and we're going to share that very openly mm -hmm. with you as I said we are absolutely going to advocate be a voice hopefully have an opportunity to share with the Commissioner what we're seeing as far as the concerns that we have as a large urban district and the time that it has taken has been phenomenal and yeah. and I want to say this publicly um, I'll have an opportunity when we have a, a subcommittee <coughs> meeting to congratulate our staff that has been out there every step of the way working with the children working with the teachers working with the technology to make sure we at least uh, had an opportunity to positive and negative to to feel to this in in a positive way meaning it's a learning way for us and that seemed to be one of the the things that was consistent throughout most of the the feedback that they got from other communities was the time and the resources that it entailed and that it took um, and the cost associated with it and of course it's an unfunded mandate again you know yeah. but and, and we have concern about that yeah. um, the one thing I'd like to say to the parents uh, again is uh, thank you for supporting us in this endeavor mm -hmm. and understand I, I can't say it enough that that we will be a voice so Brockton Public Schools will be at the table talking to the Commissioner and sharing with him our concerns um, as they make a decision whether this is the right test to go with. Um, this is again a new generation of tests. We talked about the new uh, GED test coming online. Yeah. All, you know, this is online testing. Um, you know, I, it's about as much as I can say right now. We're, we're still doing the field test. But what's what's really um, good is that we do have a voice at the state level. So they will hear your concerns. They will hear our concerns as a district. And I can't wait for you to hear Dr. Cancel, who's in my ear constantly and has <laughs> many, counting many on <laughs> concerns. So when we say we have a voice, mm -hmm. we have a voice. Yeah. So so believe me, um, you know, know. we will be there to share with you the positives uh, yeah. and the negatives. Thank you for the update. And just to share with you, the best part I keep telling you of my day is when I can get into schools. And I want to finish with just one fun story. So again, I'm at the Hancock School Thursday. I was also there today for one of my regular visits. And I had read to a class, and uh, I went into another class, a little first grade classroom. I thought it was inconspicuous, and I went in and I sat down, and the teacher was doing, it was a reading lesson. Um, they were doing predictions. It was all about vocabulary. It's great to see how far first graders come. And I sat out there enjoying the lesson and the kids kept looking they're not sure who I am I certainly didn't introduce myself I didn't interrupt the lesson and Mr. Shaw came in to find me and we were going to be heading to another class one little boy looked at Mr. Shaw when he walked in and he said Mr. Shaw your boss is here <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know you, you just have to wonder it is just the best part of my day when I get out into the school so on that note okay okay um, does any uh, member of the school committee have an item they would like to refer to a subcommittee? Nothing on the agenda for anyone this week? We have um, no. coming up, I believe, on next week, the 15th, uh, we have the accounts review, we have the bid review, um, finance, and the superintendent contract. We're kind of squeezing quite a bit in. I think we're doing about 15-minute okay. uh, intervals. Um, and we're looking to bring, um, we do have information. Uh, Mike Thomas met for the first time with, um, we're looking at the policy for overaged, undercredited students. Uh, Deputy Superintendent, do you want to share with them where we're at? But we're looking to do a policy, uh, policy meeting sometime the end of April, possibly the 29th. Yes, the task force has been meeting, and by the um, 29th, we'll have a proposal for you to, to vet, and we'll also get your opinions and ideas, and hopefully we'll be able to come up with a policy shortly after that. So um, we're meeting weekly, so we put something solid in place to bring to you on the 29th, and then we can um, you know, talk at that time and obviously come up with your concerns and ideas and work together to put something in place. Great. Well, I, I know I appreciate the immediate attention this issue has uh, been given, so I think we'll look forward to the statistics. Mr. Minicello. Thomas, what, um, what grade levels do you 
as all the way through. Yeah, yeah. yeah well basically, um, you know, obviously students um, in the upper grades, like the fourth and fifth grades of, of um, the elementary schools, and then obviously the ages of students in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and also for high school students. And also with Mr. Tarasi, who's been working with a liaison from the Department of Education to make sure that um, we're well versed in their expectations. So whatever procedures and policies that we come up with as a group, uh, um, obviously uh, um, that cover in, uh, legal and also um, fit with the Department of Ed's policies as well. So um, keeping that all in mind, you know, that we can come up with um, a solid procedure and policy. Okay, great. All right, look forward to scheduling that meeting. Yes, and I guess, Mr. Minicello, we had also talked about curriculum, uh, the park debriefing, and the health and wellness at a subcommittee meeting. So will you poll everybody and yeah, get sure. back to us on mm -hmm. a number of dates? Yeah. Do you want to say, a lot of work. is that a topic um, that would um, cover uh, one night with respect to the policy on um, student age, or is that something that we could schedule two items for that evening? That would probably take at least need a good hour, I would say, to. Okay, so maybe we can squeeze in two. On the 29th? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if everyone could look at their calendars for the 29th, I'll follow up with everyone, okay, but at least good. that gives you a, all a heads up. Good, okay, thank you, Mr. Thomas. And I think the only other date that we've come up with is uh, we're looking to get invitations out the legislative luncheon. We're looking to have that on Monday, May 5th. That's a tentative date till we can hear back from everybody. We tried to work, I believe, Fridays. We got in touch with Representative Claire Cronin's office who um, worked with the other legislators to try to come up with a date where everybody could attend. So that's very tentative right now. Okay. All right. Okay. Good now with subcommittees. Okay, under new business, Mrs. Joyce, would you like to uh, be recognized regarding building naming? Certainly. Um, we actually held the public hearing this evening at 6 p.m. It was our first go around under the new policy, so I think it went very well. Um, the public hearing was held at 6 p.m. in the Little Theater at Brockton High to discuss the proposed naming of two facilities, the Davis School Library after Marion Burke and the press box at the Rocky Marciano Stadium after Peter Farley. Um, so the subcommittee of the Building Naming Committee favorably uh, put forth these two um, requests and it went to the next uh, level which is the public hearing. So first I'd like to make a motion to approve the report of the building naming subcommittee. If we could do that first. And let's do those separately. Mm -hmm. okay, so unanimous acceptance of the report. And the second motion would be to approve the naming of the Edgar B. Davis School Library after Mary Ann Bark. Any discussion on the motion? Mr. Minister. One of the things that impresses me about that recommendation is the fact that Mrs. Burke, whom I didn't know but learned a lot about, um, is, is a resident of Brockton, not someone that worked for the school system, that this is a person that gave of their own time, that was very generous with their time and effort, um, committed to that community, that school. Um, a lot of times we're naming buildings after people that have worked in the system, um, who have been employees of the system. This is a person who you know, was not an employee. This is a person who gave of herself and you know, was highly touted by the community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mrs. Joyce certainly endorsed this person and knew of her, and so many people did. So I, I just think it's, um, I think it's special when it's someone that is not from within the system, but gives to the system. So, very much in favor of that. Yeah, I, I had an opportunity to be here early this evening and hear the testimony, and it was, uh, it was really impressive. And just to add, if I may, uh, Marianne's um, son 
and husband were in attendance in the audience and I know that it was very special for them to hear all of the wonderful accolades that were shared at the meeting um, you know even while Marianne was her health was deteriorating she still gave of herself she's never gave up and um, and she really was a very special person and it's it'll be very fitting for this library to be named after her so the students that come to that library can understand how much she gave to to every single child at that school yeah. and, and beyond so. and among the many people who testified also was the principal of the school and I mm -hmm. think we've talked about in when we're looking at a specific facility within the system that we would get input from the, the site leader for that place and th this also has the wholehearted support of the principal yeah and that that was important yeah, yeah. I'll entertain a motion then motion to accept um, the approval of the naming of the Edgar, Biggie, Edber, Edgar B. Davis School Library after Marion Burke. All in favor? That motion is approved. Okay, the second motion. To approve the naming of the press box at Marciano Stadium, I can say that a little better, after Peter Farley. Second. Okay, discussion on the motion. I'll just make a quick comment that I was one of the people who spoke in favor this earlier this evening. Uh, Mr. Farley was a friend of mine and I think it's a, a very fitting tribute to someone who had a dramatic impact on the coverage of high school sports and someone who spent a lot of time in the, the press box at Marciano Stadium. So I'm very pleased to see this come forward. If I may comment, sure. um, one of the, the comments that was made by um, Bob Buckley was that that I didn't know that Peter Fowler was very much an, a, an advocate of the Title IX in, in um, covering women's sports as well, which during that time just right. wasn't that popular. So that really was, he was definitely a person that was way beyond his years yeah. um, and giving equal coverage to both men and women's sports. Yeah, he was absolutely one of the very first to give significant coverage to, to women's high school sports mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the newspaper, absolutely. Okay. Okay, did we, uh, did we had a motion a second, so uh, all in favor? And that motion also passes unanimously. Okay. And, and I think it's a little a little bit more but our first time through using the new policy this year that we established I think it was much more thorough uh, it was you know fair and balanced but it was a I think a, a process that really gave us a chance to to vet out the uh, the nomination so I I think we're uh, I think we're on the right track I think yeah. well. all right terrific anything else uh, under new business mr. Minichella uh, just an update. I know that many of the school committee, in fact, I think most of the school committee members know that we were contemplating uh, Wednesday, May 7th for the joint convention with respect to um, replacing or filling the vacancy, I should say, of uh, the Ward 6 school committee seat. So that um, is scheduled to take place at City Hall at 7 o'clock in the GAR room which is on the second floor. Um, interested applicants can send a letter of interest to the attention of um, City Council President Robert Sullivan and to myself as Vice Chair to uh, Crescent Street, 43 Crescent Street, which is the school department building here in Brockton. Um, the deadline for that is the end of the month, April 30th. We will be posting in the Enterprise an advertisement or legal notice. Um, it will be a public meeting on um, the 7th. We will invite applicants to, uh, if they wish, to give um, a three-minute uh, presentation uh, as to why they're interested. Um, the um, we, I think we should also put um, the notification up on the city website, um, the school department website. Um, once I have the final uh, language, I will forward that on. Um, 
and actually um, community access. We'll talk to Mr. Lindy about community access, posting it there as well. If anyone has any other ideas as to where um, to post it, that's you know we're open to suggestion. But uh, you know we do have um, to date, I think six people that have expressed an interest, who have actually submitted letters of interest. So. Um, <coughs> word word is out, so yeah. it's, it's, it's no secret. The enterprise has covered it already, um, and I think the, they will be announcing perhaps in tomorrow's paper what I'm telling you this evening. So, if anyone wants to comment, criticize about it, I think there was you know people should know there was a, there was an ongoing dialogue between yourself and City Council President Sullivan to come to a meeting of the minds of the two bodies as to what would work for everybody. So uh, this is by ordinance a joint convention. So it'll be a joint meeting of the council and the school committee to select uh, the person to represent Ward 6. From every indication, a vote will be taken that evening. Right. I think so. the intention is to take a vote yeah. that evening. Yeah. So. So review the material in advance before you come. Um, Wanda has been good enough to provide us all with, in our packets tonight a folder with items we've received to date. So keep track of where you're putting this folder. <laughs> and um, you know, in next Friday night's packet, we will forward anything new that we've received from today and to the rest of the week. Just add it to your green folder so that we don't recreate the wheel. So. Sure, Mrs. Joyce. Uh, do we know or can we find out what type of format we'll be utilizing? Will there be a, uh, an opportunity to ask questions of the candidates, that type of thing? This is the first yeah, time yeah, for me, yeah, and I've been on the committee for nine years. So in, in my discussion with um, Council President Sullivan, um, again, parties will be um, will have the ability to talk to us for three minutes, and then if anyone has a question or questions they can certainly ask the candidate you know, what what okay. uh, they feel needs to be answered um, and then there will be simply a roll call vote at the end of the process as to you know who um, each member of the council and school committee will vote for and then the tally will be made and most votes will garner the seat That's 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 what it is. All right. Anything else on new business, Mr. Anderson? Just real quickly, I just wanted to, to publicly thank uh, the staff of the George School. Uh, there was an incident, uh, not in the school. There was a, a police chase uh, that ensued at D.W. Field Park, resulting in the lockdown of the George School. And I wanted to commend the staff uh, for all that they did uh, to make the children feel safe. Um, my son, you know, other than being an hour late, my son absolutely had a great time in that extra <laughs> hour. <laughs> <laughs> he played, had no idea what was going on. I think the parents were more concerned than, than, than the kids. The kids were oblivious to what was going on, but I think they did just an absolutely fantastic job continuing to make sure our kids are safe. And, and uh, you know, they just did a, a tremendous job. I can't thank them enough. Made me feel very good as a parent going to pick my kid up. And I'm glad you brought that up. You sent a note out to not just the George School, which was later. It started at the Angelo mm -hmm. School and uh, continued on to the George School. And the staff um, went right to work and, and, as you said, made sure the children felt safe, supported. Word got out to the parents. Um, I did not have one phone call on it. And yeah. I want to thank Liz, Mike, who worked diligently during the middle of a professional development that we had going with every principal. We had principals coming and going. Um, and that's what we have to do, unfortunately, in this day and age. But, you know, thank you to our police and, uh, again, to our teachers for, for a job well done. Mr. Minichelli. One incident that I found very impressive was the updates, the Connect Ed updates that were informing parents and, obviously, the school committee of what was going on. Um, I think it's essential that parents update the schools with the correct phone numbers so that they are privy to these important um, notifications, you know, when they happen. But um, it was very impressive. We probably got three or four messages within an hour and a half time 
about you know what was going on at one school and one the other school was uh, freed up um, so um, notification was was excellent um, and one final on a separate note um, very impressed with the um, middle school science fair that took place some very interesting uh, projects very um, engineering minded <laughs> students which was was impressive um, um, I also would like to thank some of the teachers and staff who volunteer their time to be judges um, it's they take their jobs very seriously and they put in a lot of time and effort um, there was one uh, there was one project that I was very impressed with and Mr. Campbell from West was very impressed with. It was a prosthetic arm with a long reach yeah. <laughs> and it was in a PVC tube and what we both observed and Mr. Campbell first said that isn't that great when the clicker is out of reach you can use this hand <laughs> reach for the clicker on the on the coffee table all, all of us men can relate to this so it, it was just a great device and it was two young ladies that developed it and what was fantastic about it was that you saw the process they had two prototypes that they used that didn't they weren't too impressed with and they finally had their third prototype which they will call it perfected but it was very interesting and very fun but um, it was a, it was a nice night yeah it was fantastic there was uh, Two people, at least, that had hover crafts that you could stand on and, and float around, and, and they just had some just amazing things that I couldn't believe that they could come up with. Um, okay. Do, do, do you have something else? I'm all set. Oh, no, I just have I have two quick ones. Uh, I just want to publicly thank my colleague, uh, Mr. Robinson, for joining me in Boston this morning. Bick uh, led a meeting. Uh, to advocate for a drug court for the Brockton District Court and we had an opportunity to meet with uh, Chief Justice Dolly and also Justice Julie Bernard and uh, uh, John Messia of BIC led it but uh, Andy and I both participated along with Councilor Rodriguez so Andy I just want to thank you for taking the time to come in and participate in that and uh, the superintendent mentioned earlier but just make a last minute plug for the mayor's youth summit thursday at the uh, brockton high school red cafeteria 2 30 to about 7 i think uh, and we encourage uh, all you know young people from across the city uh, to participate uh, including southeastern regional students and uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it's one of the more challenging things. A couple of Sundays ago, I was invited to uh, talk to a group of young adults at St. Edith Stein, and uh, I think there was about 40 of them, and they put me in the center of the room, and they're all in a circle. And I answered questions for an hour, and it was, having come off a campaign not too long ago, it was, uh, it was reminiscent of some of the tougher questioning I've had in some time, but it, was, but it was great to hear a perspective from younger people and how they view what the issues are that are facing the city, and the viewpoint's a little different. And uh, they really challenged me on a couple of things, and that, that's, that's okay, that's, that's actually why we're there. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to my first youth summit on Thursday afternoon, and the superintendent will be joining me, and, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it, and I hope we get a good turnout. Anyone else? And I'll entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Meeting adjourned. <coughs>